When planning to localize the long-awaited duology in the West, Capcom likely had to look for advice from lawyers to avoid the attention of a certain litigious foundation. However, it wasn't the only instance where someone with a law background got involved with the creation of Chronicles. It turns out that one of the English voice talents is a former lawyer, and the identity of this man is Nigel Pilkington, who graced us as the voice of Takatuchi Aochi. Objection! And while this nugget of information is interesting enough to warrant a place in this video, this story doesn't stop here. Mr. Pilkington obtained his law degree from none other than the much prestigious Cambridge University, leaving little doubt that he is a very learned friend and he would have cracked the Queen's English as soon as the words came out of the lady's mouth. Speaking of the Queen's English, unfortunately, there's no way of decrypting what Giselle actually said during most occasions where she demonstrated her superior command of the English language. While there are instances where she spurts out words like sorry or excuse me using a legible font, in the majority of cases another font is being used, and the sentences look like this, which does not match up with what's displayed on screen, meaning that this is a completely custom font consisting of random squiggles rather than something readable. That, or Giselle's real motive for killing Dr. Wilson is that he was the only person in the near vicinity capable of making some sense out of it. to working on this project. Game director Shu Takumi and art director Katsuya Nuri had their hands full producing a crossover, which pitted Phoenix Wright against puzzle detective Professor Layton, which also marked their first attempt at bringing the world of Ace Attorney into 3D. Not only was the transition to 3D a challenge in itself, but they were also tasked with blending two stylistically different worlds together. And while the end result in this artistic endeavor leans towards being more latent esque with the occasional Ace Attorney style character in the mix, it left a big impression on the Ace Attorney team, and the influence is nowhere as apparent as in the great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Shu Takumi went as far as designing some characters to reference the crossover, and it doesn't take much for us to spot these outliers and their inspirations, the likes of which include William Shakespeare and Birdley, Banker Durer and Amir Punchenborg, typist slash telegraphist Durer and Miss Primstone, as well as Nan Durer and Mary. Those are not the only takeaways from the crossover, however. When you look through the model data in the game files, there's a very interesting secret to uncover, and hilariously enough, it concerns the character who would revel in such a discovery as well as the dissecting process. I am of course talking about Maria Gori, whose texture files contains remnants of a blonde-haired woman, which is of course a face we've seen a lot in a crossover, that being Espella Cantabella. And while it's no secret that game developers love reusing models for the sake of saving time, we've yet to discover another blatant borrowing from another game no less. This is made even more curious by the fact that Venus, who looks like she could be Espella's mysterious twin sister, hides no such secrets. When Ryu and Susato arrive on the streets of London, they soon find themselves in a sea of garish signs which symbolises the rise of consumerism throughout Victorian Great Britain. And while these establishments won't raise our eyebrows in terms of their repertoire, their names might, especially if you hail from the Great British Isles. When browsing through the signs, you'll find names such as Terry, Cleese, Palin, Gilliam, Idol and Jones. These are of course references to the legendary British comedy troupe Monty Python, referring to each member of the group, with the curious exception of George Chapman, the only member to pass away during the troupe's run, although his greatest role, that of Brian from Monty Python and the life of Brian, may be referenced here. 
And this one here is probably a reference to a very inappropriate joke from the same movie. In addition, there's another business name that may cause locals to do a double take, and that is the much talked about location in the memoirs of the clouded Kokoro, the slug and salad. It is a reference to the real life restaurant and bar chain Slug and Letters, which has 70 or so restaurants spread mostly around London and southeast England. And while Van Seeks makes a comment about Slug and Salad being a tad too fancy for the likes of Shamsphere, Slug and Letters, on the other hand, is generally not showered with such compliments, as it's one of those chains that, just like its more famous competitor, Weatherspoons, took over the streets of the UK thanks to their cost cutting measures, which include microwaving food items for serving. And while this technology is bound to excite just about any Victorian with a harebrain for a friend, I don't think Van Six is up for some molecule magic anytime soon. When you make the effort of counting the models of both games combined and you were to include alternate costumes in your tally, The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles contains around a hundred different character models. Resolve is the only game in the series to feature a model for each of the trial victims, which most would probably agree is the equivalent of having sprites for the same lot in a 2D game. To kickstart the bucket, we have Giselle Brett, who was a character in Adventures but her model and animation files are stored in Resolve and you can see her during some flashbacks. William Shamsphere, likewise was present in Adventures for a whole 5 seconds and in Resolve he was dead for another 5 seconds before he resurrected himself for the purpose of only showcasing the most front facing animations out of any model in the history of Ace Attorney. Oh the ass man. Odi <laughs> sorry <laughs> Odi Asman who has the distinction of being the only character to not have a connection to the previous game is the one waving at us in the intricate scene of the return of the great departed soul and waves us goodbye in one of Sif's flashbacks. And while some will argue that he doesn't count since he's never presented through a so-called sprite angle, I say as long as we can place him in search and make it look official, it counts. And finally, we have poor Gregson. Let me just say that this section has been a roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> The only game to get close to this achievement is Apollo Justice, with three victims out of a total of four or five victims depending on how you include turnabout succession in your tally. If you were to include victims who appear in future games, then Adventures also crosses the halfway mark, but in most cases the numbers range from zero to two. And while Genshin Asogi does not qualify as a trial victim, and even if he were, the meticulously crafted Vax model of him would not qualify for many reasons, there is an unused model in the game files that was probably meant to depict him as he was still alive. This model, just like the Vax model, has him wearing the mask and he can be seen sitting down with his back slightly hunched over. The texture of the model consists of only a black square, meaning we would possibly have seen him through a silhouette in a dark environment. My personal theory is that this model was probably meant to be in the flashbacks that took place where Genshin, behind the jail bars, was talking to Daily Visual, Mayor Strongheart or Yuji Mikotoba in the aftermath of the Professor trial. There's much more to discover when it comes to removed content in the Great Ace Attorney Chronicle, but that's a topic for another video in hopefully the not so distant future. We have now reached the mandatory part of any Ace Attorney trivia, and that is the subject of puns. Fans of name puns will no doubt notice the lower pun count in Chronicles compared to the pun cranky machine that was Spirit of Justice, for better or worse. These have been dropped to make way for direct references to Sherlock Holmes characters, or such as in this case, objects. 
While I won't recount all of them in this video, as that's a subject for another day, I will talk about one of my favorite monikers in Chronicles, and that is carried by the elegant assassin Asa Shin. And while I wouldn't place Dead Man anywhere near this woman for the fear of her killing him in the afterlife, that's not the name I'm chasing on this occasion. Instead, I'm going to talk about her alias, Giselle Brett. Since it naturally doesn't sound like a pun, it's reasonable to consult the Sherlockian canon in this matter. Luckily, we don't have to go that deep, as the name's origin can be traced to the first page in the very first Sherlock Holmes novel, A Study in Scarlet. It is a reference to a bullet fired from a Giselle rifle which were carried by locals in the Second Anglo-Afghan War. This weapon would strike Dr. Watson in the leg, which subsequently led to his early discharge from war and a fateful meeting with the great detective. Her name was literally Giselle Bullet in the Japanese version, before the English version it was changed to Brett as it was a more legitimate name and the Japanese spelling of Brett, Buretto, can stem from either Brett or Bullet. I personally wouldn't have minded if they kept Bullet, as she could be scolding people for not calling her Boulet like some 19th century version of Hyacinth Bucket. Oh, Mrs. Bucket. <laughs> but as it currently stands, Brett may hide another delightful reference. It may, after all, be a nod to the late great Jeremy Brett the actor who played Sherlock Holmes in the TV adaptation produced during the 80s and 90s. This wouldn't be the only reference to the TV show, as Pop Windybank and the whole pawnbroking business in The Adventure of the Unspeakable Story is almost a carbon copy of Jabez Wilson and his pawnbrokers in the TV series take on The Adventure of the Red-Headed League. The TV show had a considerable success in Japan during its run, and Jeremy Brett would inspire many future Sherlock incarnations with his passionate performance where he injected some of his own eccentricities into the character he would sometimes go over the top oh sorry Holmes no no you couldn't have come at a better time but oftentimes he would also bring a darker side to the character, reaching new heights and opposite ends of a personality spectrum which sadly mirrored his real battle with bipolar disorder at the time. Jeremy would suffer several tragedies during the show's run, causing him to develop more severe mood swings and health problems, and as his energy started to run out as evident during the show's last season, so did the Jeremy in Sherlock. Playing the textbook Recluse would also take a toll on his health, and he would meet an untimely death after playing the character for 10 years. While we may not know whether he had a hand in influencing the character of Herlock, although one side of me thinks Herlock inherited the hand gestures that Brett made popular, I am of the opinion that Herlock succeeds at accentuating the more carefree personality traits that likewise made Jeremy Brett's Sherlock Holmes such a joy to watch, and played a great part in transforming Jeremy into the definitive version of Sherlock Holmes in the eyes of many. Even if the Brett reference were to be a complete accident, be that as it may, I'll happily accept any opportunity to talk about this great actor and the legacy he left behind. <laughs> Thank you.